Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on prefabrication best practices. Our guest speakers today are Britton Langdon, Vice President of Technology and founder of MSuite, and Jim Tedrow, the Piping Operations Leader for Modern Companies. Britton Langdon leads a new initi initiative to connect software, hardware, tools, and machinery in one connected ecosystem for trade contract. Today, <clears throat> Britton came from DeWalt when the company he founded, MSuite, was acquired earlier this year. Jim Tedro has been with modern companies for 23 years and is their piping operations leader. Jim leads a group of field general foremen and shop management personnel in implementing new technologies, best practices, install standards, and processes. Thank you, Burton and Jim, for joining us today. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourselves? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate it. Uh, as Todd said, uh, Britton Langdon, um, Vice President of Construction Technology at Stanley Black & Decker DeWalt, um, came from MSuite, which actually came out of Modern, where Jim and I created the very first version of this software and then spun it out to, uh, to benefit the rest of the industry. And MSuite is a management suite of software that connects BIM, FAB, and field teams. Uh, via customizable workflows, allows the companies that use it to track status and productivity of everything that goes through those processes. So uh, excited to be here today and uh, go ahead, Jim. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Jim Tedrill. I've been at Modern Companies here for 23 years. I started as a helper, shop truck driver, gopher person, and got did that for a couple of years, got into the apprenticeship, served my apprenticeship as a plumber here at Modern. Um, Ran work in my fifth year of apprenticeship for the company um, with truck and phone out in the field. Um, in 2009, they invested heavy in fab some fabrication equipment. So I started managing the fab shop then. Um, we developed that into a small 20,000 square foot shop to a 70,000 square foot shop that we have here now uh, that we moved out here in 2014. I did some project management in 2015, where I did industrial project management, commercial project management, along with managing the fab shop. Um, so I've, I've worn many hats here. And about a year and a half ago, I started as our piping functional lead or piping operations leader, um, where like Todd was explaining, I have our field general foreman the, that report to me and the fab shop manager on the piping side as well. Uh, so I lead those groups on the best practices for modern. And yeah, thanks for jumping on today, everybody. Looking forward to it. Todd, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, but thanks for the intro, Britt and Jim. Um, just to give a little background on what we plan to review today during, during the webinar. Um, Britton and Jim will be talking a little bit about what pre or prefabrication means to their businesses, uh, how to embark on prefabrication on your journey to do it with confidence, the technologies and fabrication strategies contractors are currently using today, and how to utilize prefabrication to mitigate schedule risk, lower costs, and increase workplace safety. Uh, we will have a Q&A throughout today's discussion, um, so please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Uh, please enter any questions you have um, using that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens, or we'll do our best to answer all of your questions as they come in. Keep in mind this webinar will be recorded today, so any questions that are not addressed during the webinar today will be emailed out following the webinar. Uh, with that said, Britton and Jim, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I am going to, as Jim starts to share his screen here, I'm going to start a first poll. Uh, we're going to have, I think, three polls today, and they're just kind of to get an idea of who's on the line and uh, and sort of where you're at with your prefabrication journey and, and um, and you know, what does prefabrication mean to you in terms of its benefits. So I will launch that right now. You should see it on your screen. Go ahead and answer now. There will be live answers, and uh, I'll share those with you as soon as the polls up here. Jim, if you want to share your screen, you can. Uh, they should see this on top of on top of it. Yep, we should be sharing now. Cool, well, we're getting a lot of good responses. What trade do you most associate with? And uh, I would say the vast majority are mechanical and plumbing contractors. Little bit of sheet metal, little bit of fire suppression, electrical, concrete, and other. We'll give it about another 10 seconds. 
handful of you still haven't answered. I can see that. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like when you're in grade school and they're waiting. There we go. Now I see them starting to come in. Okay. All right. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. You guys should see the results here. Like I said, about 60% of you mechanical, 48% plumbing, a few sheet metal, one general contractor, and uh, a few other people. So awesome. Thank you all very much. Jim, go ahead and introduce Modern and how you guys approach the business from a prefab perspective. So yeah, here at Modern, our motto is we try to fab everything or touch every piece of pipe that's going out to a project. Um, we do industrial and commercial, and we have sheet metal, industrial and commercial here. We have a compressed air division as well. We have a service department with oh, somewhere around 30 guys out in the field, so we do quite a bit. Um, but again, we want to touch every piece of pipe on, on jobs that are going out to the field. We understand the benefits of prefab, that offsite construction where we can eliminate the waste here. We can use our resources, the power supplies here. We don't have to set those up on the job site. Um, we did analysis on wrench time and you can get about seven and a half hours of productivity in, in a fab shop versus about five hours if you're lucky in the field with all the the JHAs and the safety things, the hot work permits and things like that. Um, we can save that from doing that offsite construction. Um, so yeah, we're big on that. That's our goal is to try to touch every piece of pipe on jobs. Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, there are a lot of people that haven't really embarked on this journey. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions as we go through this. Yeah, but so, the first one, oh, go yeah, ahead. The, first, the first one I have is, you, know, you talk about seven and a half hours of, of of direct labor time in the shop versus somewhere around five in the field. I oftentimes get the question of, you know, how does prefab benefit our business? Because, you know, I got to pay the same guy uh, the same wage rate. So whether he's doing it in the shop or the field, it's the same amount of money for me. So why is it beneficial to us as a company? We're going to get a little bit further down that path later in the meeting or later in the webinar, but I wanted to see just out of the gate, what was the first kind of reason you guys decided to start fabbing back in, you know, 09 or even before? Um, it, it increases our chances to beat labor. And we pick up efficiencies that that could be MIG welding or the cut tables, the automations, which we're going to get into. Um, technology is huge. It feels like technology is moving as fast as it's ever moved in construction right now. So when you do things in a shop, you understand the bottlenecks. That's easier to do on in a shop than on a job site. You have all the tools. They have the guys in the plumbing areas or the clean rooms or the welding stations. They have everything that they need. They're not running after tools. You know, we kit everything out on the front end as much as possible. Um, so that's organizing the fittings for that package of work and we marry it up with the cut pieces. So what that does for us is it allows us to figure out if we're missing any parts or pieces before it hits fabrication. So it's really efficient. Um, we looked at lean flow things when we when we laid out our shop back in 2014. I think you remember that, Britton, when we went through Painfully. shop flows and things <laughs> like that. Um, you know, it just, yes. it gives you those opportunities to pick up those labor efficiencies much easier than it is on a job site. You know, job sites, it's hard to manage control. You got other trades, things like that. You have weather. We don't have that in our shop. But, I, you know, I, and I hate to, to continue down this path, but we got a good question in from Travis Beecher out uh, in Utah. And Travis asked, how did you get your field to buy off or how do you get your field to buy off on fabricating smaller copper and DWV piping? But even I would just say more generically, because I know the history here a little bit. How, how did you go about getting the field to buy in on prefab in general? It's, it's not easy. It takes effort. You, you got to be accurate in what you're doing. You got to, you know, I would suggest identifying a champion that's leading that charge that takes the accountability of it. And that's, they're looking at everything, you know, making sure CAD's getting the right information on that stuff because it's highly accurate. So what helped us was that CAD accuracy, like for copper, for example, we cut it to length and send it out to the field for our field to install. Then we kit it out with all the fittings that they need to do it. We put it on a nice little cart. It has all the pipe cut to length. It has their fittings on the bottom of the cart and, and that goes out to the field. Um, if it's not accurate, the field's gonna scream. Uh, if it's accurate, they're like, thumbs up. Can we do this again? Cause it saves them all that layout or stove piping, we call it, you know, they got to measure every piece and 
deal with the other trades. Uh, CAD's able to lay that out for them. And we, one thing Modern has done is we pulled some of our, our good guys out in the field and they're our designers in our CAD department right now. So they're laying out the piping and in, in the models um, to reduce fittings and things like that. So we have the right guys doing those things we feel like, and it's highly accurate again. And it I works. It works out. That the was it. And th that helps with the buy-in. If it's accurate and they can install it super fast, they're going to do that every time. And now, they're, huge... you know, now once we start that, they're asking for more information on drawings from the field. Hey, can you give me uh, dimensions off column lines, things like that. Now they're asking for way more information than we provided before, which is pretty neat. And it's been such a, a huge transition from, from at least when I started there till, till today. I mean, I remember when we first started really trying to push prefab, I got told by a handful of our field people that they are pipe fitters, not pipe installers. And uh, they didn't like the idea of prefabrication coming from the shop. And to your point, Jim, now they're clamoring for it because they can get it faster. They can get it sort of on demand. They, they know that it's going to be done really well. Um, and it's done by their buddies. A lot of times it's guys coming from in the field or from the field back into the shop or in the BIM department. They know it's a, sort of a team effort now and it's not just some, you know, black right. hole of fabrication. One big benefit for us was we, we invested in a 3D scanner because not all jobs are going to be BIM coordinated model jobs. Um, so we had a, we bought a 3D scanner and we took some industrial jobs that I was even managing way back in 2016. We 3D scanned it. Then we can able, we produce the spool drawings from that 3D scan. So the guy in the field didn't have to get up in a lift and lay out all this, figure out his holes that he had to core through walls, things like that. We were able to fabricate all the spools for that job before we even knew who the foreman was on site. And then he got all his stuff and it went in highly accurate. He, he asked for that on the next job. So it's things like that, that, that you can do as a company uh, to get the buy-in from the field. That helps a lot. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going with the your presentation. Okay, so at Modern, I think you all can see we got uh, we got our headquarters in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We have an office in Des Moines, Dubuque, Davenport, and in Blaine, Minnesota. And our fab shop is supporting all our markets right now currently. Our fab shop is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at our headquarters. Um, and it supports all our markets at this time. One, one, one thing I want to point out right here is that, though, that is you guys do work all over the country. Uh, you we have do. some customers that take you all over. You guys do fab work for other people across the country. We do. Um, so it's not just, even though those offices are local in Iowa and one in Minnesota, you guys are really pretty broad. Yeah, we ship fab all over the East Coast right now. Down South, we got fab going. So yeah, we, we have fab going all over the U.S. And I think it's important because a lot of people don't realize, even with the shipping costs today, it still makes sense to ship fab across the country, depending on you know, total cost. And that was something we always heard from the field. Well, it's extra deliveries and stuff like that. Well, it's managed deliveries and it's only one to 2% of that project. So it's very minimal and it's managed deliveries. Like when, when we order from the supply house and if they're going to do it out in the field, they don't know exactly when that truck's going to come. So it's a little tricky to manage. Um, and, and again, we run that stuff all through the shop. We identify back orders and things like that. And we're pushing that, that those. And you're trying to ship full loads as best you can. Absolutely. We, that's our, that's our motto is shipping full packages. Um, but for modern here, we've been around over 80 years. This is our little timeline here kind of tells our history. So like some big ones here, we opened Dubuque office in 01. Um, we brought modern sheet metal in here. We started that in 2013. Open Quad Cities in 2013. Blaine, Minnesota was opened in 03. Um, Cedar Rapids, the fab shop, we, we, we bought the new building here in 2014. That's that 70,000 square foot shared fab shop with piping and sheet metal. Des Moines, 2014. And then we brought on compressed air in 2015. So that's kind of our little timeline there, modern. Um, so why do we do what, what we do and what some of the stuff you guys are about to see? and we went to advancing prefab conference a couple of years ago, myself and a couple of colleagues, and we heard some things there that really created a light bulb in my head. And it was a big thing was how can you take a project and turn it into product based, not being project based one off every time. So that embarked a journey for us at looking at developing products that you guys are about to see here. We also heard without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So 
We were looking at the DFMA, that's that design for manufacturing assembly things. And again, turning those projects into product based, building a proof book off of those products. So it's, if we do a product, it's easy to get the metrics and the cost for those things. It becomes harder out in the field. We, we generate total team alignment and then we pull those KPIs for, for our products and as much as we can throughout, throughout modern. Why products? Uh, because you can start fabrication much sooner. So you don't have to, excuse me, you don't have to wait for CAD to draw in wall plumbing, for example. We can fabricate those items within a couple of weeks of being awarded a job. We just got to match the job spec and things like that, because typically we own that in wall space. So we're able to fab way ahead of schedule. We can do all the components for all the lavatories on a job. If a job has 80 lavies, we're able to fabricate those much sooner because we have a product. Our CAD department has it in their, their Revit library as a part, so they can just pull that in when it comes time for design. We avoid any hand ISOs, or again, having CAD generated from scratch, we've eliminated that. They have it in their library. It's, it's those repeatable, predictable items. If it's repeatable, we're going to build it into a product. So our challenges around products was identifying a champion to lead the charge. Uh, we're noticing that that's helps us be much more successful if we can identify a champion. I was a champion on, on developing our products. Uh, we tried developing products for years where we had a group of five or six people. It becomes very challenging. Um, so I, I was a champion and I had just a, a person under me helping me develop all our products. And, and that helped us be successful. And, it, and it's changing the culture, you know, it's, you know, Britt mentioned the, the field guys, they become installers. Um, it's changing their mindset a little bit, but again, it's getting it built, getting it accurate, getting it out to the field, making them aware of what they're getting before they, they're, they're receiving it on site. And then it becomes predictable for them. We can talk, hey, do you need the screws to screw it in the studs? What do you need? Let's make sure you get it. Yeah, and I think before you jump on two things, um, yeah. the the first thing is just at a high level, what is a product? A product is, you know, a sub-assembly or an assembly that, like you said, is repeatable is uh, as, a, and we'll go through a bunch of examples here in a second, but is, is something, no matter what the trade is, uh, it could be a standard length of pipe or conduit. It could be uh, a panel that you guys build on the electrical side a thousand times over or on the plumbing side, you'll see some examples here. On the piping side, it could be um, a number of things, hangers, uh, et cetera. So I just wanna kind of take one step back. And then the other thing I wanna do is um, before we jump into the products, I wanna send out our second poll, which is the percentage of prefab. So what percentage of your work do you prefab today? So go ahead and take a couple, uh, 30 seconds or so, and we'll, we'll answer this. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you the results and while, while they're doing that, Jim, you know, one of the things I'd like to kind of say is that part of the productization or standardization that you guys are doing, I think is, uh, the, the part of the benefit I should say that a lot of people don't think about is the fact that because it's standardized, there's a lot less, uh, thought and, um, questioning of the drawing there's a lot less time spent in coordination around those things like this is how we build what we build and we built this thing a hundred times this year uh, i don't have to scrutinize the angle of change at the bottom left corner of the drawing because i've seen it a hundred times before uh, whereas if it's completely custom or bespoke every time it's natural for someone to look at the drawing and really want to understand what they're building before they build it so they don't make a mistake but when it's the same thing they've already done a hundred times, it's just, it just becomes sort of the way. So that's one thing I think people don't really think about much with that is that it does make the life of the person on the shop floor a heck of a lot simpler and a lot easier. Agreed. Okay, so I'll go ahead and end the poll, share the results. Uh, looks like not a lot, less than 25%, the bulk of the answers, uh, 25 to 50% right there with it. And then a big jump from 75% or more. So uh, kind of even across those three. So that's uh, very interesting. Thank you, everybody. And again, as we continue to go through this, uh, feel free to ask any questions as Jim talks. And uh, we'll either answer them at the end or I'll jump in and, and ask them for you as we go. Okay, go ahead, Jim. 
Okay, so here's, we put all our product forms on, sh on our SharePoint site. So it becomes web-based. It's not on our network drive where our field guys have to VPN in, anything like that. They just jump on the web, go to our SharePoint. And here's, here's just a screenshot of some of the products on our SharePoint site. It's a fillable submittable form that goes to the PM, the fab shop and the foreman filling it out on the project. So it's kind of like our little library here, our proof book, if you will. So like up here, we have hanger products that can be filled out. Um, we've taken our hangers and made those into a product. So we're not cutting them in the fab shop and sticker in every one anymore. We will if we have to, but the, typically we're not. We haven't done since we made a product. We have mop basin stub outs, laundry boxes, ice maker boxes, stub outs for lavatories. We have 19 different sink stub out examples made up and that's to meet the spec of the job. That's to a no hub, PVC, PEX, sweat, press to meet all those specs. We've done drinking fountain stub outs. We've done shower valves here. So we have all those on our SharePoint site for our foreman or PM to fill out. On the right here is kind of that auto-generated email. Once you submit the form, here is an example of Steve Miller. The PM was Corey Bolsinger. It went to the three guys in the fab shop. And here's the order. It gives them the PDF that they'll upload into Fab Pro. So then we can track that and see the percent complete as our fab shop's doing it. So and again, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. One, one question, go back real quick. The yeah. the list of the list of things here, how how do you come up with those? And is it is it pretty static? Or are you guys kind of reviewing this on a, on a somewhat so frequent So we numbered them. So we, we number them. We try to describe what they are, right? Floor mount, toilet, stub out. That's a TSO1. So what, what that does for us is our, our main vendor knows the bombs. If I go ahead one slide, you'll see there's a bomb on every one of these. So our vendor knows PSO1. We can make it super easy. And we send them an email. Hey, we want 80 PSO1s. We want, could be 120 PSO14s. They send us all the components that we need. So what that does, if I go a slide ahead, they will send 10 foot pieces of copper. So they'll quantify this 80 by 80 and send us. So we're not cutting the copper. We're not getting full lengths. They're sending us 10 foot. If it's PEX, we will cut the PEX. Um, and then they send us all the, we standardize on Sioux Chief products as well. So they send us all the power bars, touchdown clamps, uh, the Omni boxes that are Sioux Chief. They'll send the PEX elbow. That happens to be a PEX one, for example. So we keep that 90 nice and tight. Um, the shower valve on the right, same thing. They'll send us 50 of those. They quantify it and send it to our shop. And so now, now they're keeping a lot of those things in stock. So they've upped their quantities for us because that's what we've standardized on. So it makes it seamless. So Jason Wagner actually just asked a question, but I, I have a, a sort of a follow along because you kind of answered it already. He asked, have you found an increase in collaboration or at least interest with your manufacturers like Sioux Chief? But also have you been able, because you standardized for, with them, were you able to negotiate the price a little bit easier? Um, you know, because you're saying, look, we're not going to change. This is the way we build what we build. We're going to need your best price. So obviously, Sioux, Sioux Chief loves modern for picking them. Um, we feel like they were superior. Um, nothing against the hold right stuff. This, this stuff works for us. We feel it's a good product. It holds everything together well. Um, so for pricing, yes. When we embarked on the journey, it was hard to get pricing up front because we don't know what that order is going to look like initially. But they knew. They gave us a pretty good pricing up front, but then we revisit that every year and negotiate. Based on the quantities and all yeah. that. Yep. Yep. And doing the products helps us negotiate those things as well. You know, that's another benefit you can pull um, from doing the products. We can quantify how many we did annually and then go back to our vendors for that pricing. Absolutely. Okay. And I, and Justin Howe actually asked a question too that I think parlays into something else I wanted to ask. And that is, you know, he's asking, do you bring in your, your field teams to review design for spooling and, and things like that? Or is it just purely done by the designers? But I want to well, dovetail that into, well, I want to dovetail it into the product side as well. Like, I know you've got that list of products that you guys have put in your proof book yep. and kind of what I was asking earlier, are you adding more products to that on a periodic basis or how are you doing that? So, so we're questions. actually looking at just, we are emailing actually just today, actually, we're looking at doing a urinal product a stub out for a urinal. 
Um, we have carrier templates as products uh, as well that I think you'll see through some of the slides. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking at skids. So we do a lot of skid work here at Modern. So we're looking at like a template design for a base skid at 5,000 pound rated, 10,000, 15, 20, and having the engineers stamp drawing for that. So we're ready to go. Cause that was a struggle that we had. If we're trying to do skids on jobs, you know, making sure it's rated. The, cust the owner or customer might be asking, hey, is this rated? Can, it, can we fly it in? So we're trying to cover those bases that well. So anything that we're gonna build repeatable, we're gonna make into a product. Okay, so then the second aspect of that is, and I know that we, you've got a lot of field people in on the design side already, but are you bringing in field leadership to talk about each project and how, not we necessarily are. productization side, but like just spooling and- We are, it's breaks. something that we, we struggled with in the past a little bit, I'll say, but in the last year, we've started bringing our foreman in on the beginning of a project. We're actually letting them package the product, the, the project and the packages, how they wanna install it. So they might go through the contract drawings, highlight a circle of, hey, I want this a package. I want this a package on this drawing. And we give it to our CAD team. So that helps us aware, the foreman's in more aware than he would be historically. They weren't engaged, you know, till later on. Um, we do weekly DNF meetings and team meetings where we're reviewing the packages before it goes to the fab shop with the foreman. DNF. So he can put a thumbs what's, up. He can, what's that? What's, what's DNF? It's a design and fabrication schedule that we use internally here to put the dates, the due dates, the site wants it um, on site. So then we know the CAD time frame, we know the fab time frame, and then we build a schedule internally. So we give the CAD the right amount of time. We give the fab shop the right amount of time to do their tasks for those packages that are called out by the foreman. So yes, we are... A foreman are putting their eyes on every package before it goes to the fab shop now. Awesome, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so if I move on, here's just more products. Here's that laundry box. There's an ice maker box. So, you know, you might say, God, is it worth it? Well, yeah, we sent 120 ice maker boxes to a job. Allows them to, to have that little product. They can take 10 up on this floor, they can, spread them out on that project where they go and install those much faster than stove piping them one off, you know, mounting the box, doing the next step. We eliminated all those steps for them and we can do it in the fab shop and do multiples, hundreds of them at a time. Um, here's just a mop basin example. So again, it's two cheap products, drop ear 90s, simple, simple to do. And here's just some examples of Suchi products that we like. Their little stub outs actually have the stop on it. So these are our preferred. Uh, it eliminates that step. It, it eliminates the copper stub out. Um, it's got the trim ring on it that slides in, it snaps in. They can pull that off when they're ready to, to go to the stop. The stop's already on. So the field doesn't have to clean up all the drywall spatter, the mud and tape that gets dropped on them. Um, it makes it easier for them to drain it when they test it when they leak test it. So it's easier for them to control the water versus cutting it with a copper cutter. Um, they have different examples of discussions. So it makes us, it eliminates steps. So if we're looking at those things. Any way we can eliminate joints and steps, we're doing it on our products. Question for you, just yeah. one thing back is yeah. with your products and your proof book, are you guys seeing right now at all that your field is ordering those things, you know, I guess outside of the BIM, I know they're outside the BIM process, but what I mean is like, instead of field drawing something, they're ordering from that catalog, or is it still just purely new, sort of new project, new construction type requests? It's, it's the new ones. There, there's times where there's small jobs. So what I've told, like some of our field general foreman and our other markets, and I use them as a group to develop our products as well. So we're getting the feedback from our real top of the line uh, field leaders. Um, but what we've said to them, if you have a one-off small little, little job, use Sioux Chief products. Look at that for an install. You know that's gonna be faster than the traditional method of how we used to do it. So if they have to do them in the field, we want them to use their products. We wanna obviously fabricate them, but if it's only a couple up in Minnesota, we're not gonna fabricate and ship them up there. They're gonna, they're gonna put them together in the field, but at least we've standardized on the Sioux Chief products as much as possible throughout our company. 
Well, I guess it's that's it's also in an effort to reduce the number of field requests, the yeah. you know the hand ISOs that are coming in, stuff like that. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Nope. All good. So here's like the the expandable bars that that expand and hit the stud on each side. Um, those are the touchdown clamps that you see there. They snap in. They're super fast, super easy. On the right here is that's a what we use on the shower head. So that's a drop ear 90. Sioux Chief makes these little rods that go in their power bars and it makes it slick and easy. So then the guys in the field don't have to go after wood backing or a metal backing or anything like that. We have it on our product. Hey, and I got to ask a question because of, you know, uh, my new employer. How, how has this right. changed, if at all, uh, the types of tools that are needed uh, for install versus prefab. I mean, that little scenario right there, you're not, you're doing, you're eliminating a ton of work and really the tooling on that is next to nothing. So how has that influenced what you guys are using from that perspective? You know, that's a good question. It's, I don't know if I can really answer because really they're, they have their gang box of tools on those projects and they really have everything that they need here, regardless of what we give them. We want them prepared for anything. If they got to redirect and do this or that, we, we don't want them to do a call every week for a redirection on a tooling. So typically, sure. you know, we, we tool them up with their gang boxes, whether it's a fitter or plumber gang box or a sheet metal gang box, they have everything they need so they can do okay. basically anything on that job. So it really hasn't, hasn't reduced much tooling because they still have to connect to it, whether it's like a press joint or a sweat joint or PEX, mm -hmm. they still have that tooling on site course yep. to do the field joints so cool. no yep. real reduction there um here's our hanger products so we don't cut the hangers to length anymore we used to um we used to sticker every hanger that tied it to a location on an install print that we'd give our field so it could be a package of 800 hangers to do 800 hangers if you cut them to length every one that's 800 cuts put the clevis to it. You got to put a sticker on the clevis that ties it to that specific location. Then it goes out to the field in a couple different carts um, that look like this. So on the left, you're going to see the old method where we stickered every clevis hanger that ties it to that location. Never does it work out in the field. Are they able to install one to 800? Never worked that way. So when we follow these out to the field, we were seeing our field guys were looking for hanger 220 to 350. That's what they could install this time, just how the job was working out. So it became a needle in a haystack. They had to take them apart, put things back together. It was, got a little bit confusing for them. There's times where we were putting two to four inches of random on the rod for the field to cut again for the floor deflection that we see on big jobs. Um, so we've eliminated that. We don't cut it in the fab shop anymore. Eliminated that step. So on the right, you see those are our hanger products. I'll go back a step now. And this is the drawing or our fillable submittable form for our hanger product. So if it's a long rod job, the shortest you can buy all thread is six foot. So typically we don't go over six foot on our hangers on our CAD BIM coordinated job. So that covers us. So we'll put a single clevis that you see on the, on the left for a six foot rod job. Then we send that out to the field, kit it out, and the field can cut it. We're given one dimension to the field crews, the cut list. So they can verify it. If they're seeing anything in the field, they're seeing that floor, def floor deflection, they accommodate it in the field with just that one cut. If it's a short rod job, like a three foot rod, theoretical job, we'll pull a dimension in CAD. And if it's under three foot that we see, we're gonna, we're gonna do the double clevis, we call it. And that's what you see kind of in the middle here. We'll put a clevis on each side of that six foot rod. Then on the right, further over, you see we do the same thing for our trapeze hangers. If we do trapeze, we, we either do a single or a double. I, and again, I want to go I gotta stop you right here though, because this is yeah. one of the more hotly debated things in the industry right now, because I want to say that modern has done every variation of this possible too, because even when I was back there back in what, 2014, 2013, they were doing a big hospital job where they went and shot every single hanger point spray painted the point on the ceiling, did the exact uh, measurement of length for the rod, labeled every single rod, cut to the exact length, maybe with an inch or two of, of, uh, of variance, but pretty much dead on. And then 
then it went to the, well, that wasn't maybe the best idea. So let's do it where we round everything up to a foot or a two foot length. And they had this, you can't really see, well, you can actually in the right picture, it's this metal tall thing sort of uh, to the left of those hangers. That's a bin where we used to put the uh, every we two inch rods. rod length. Yeah, rod lengths. And There's different so, little sleeves in there for rods and two inch increments for three eighths and half inch rods. So we could have an apprentice, if he was slow, he could fill that bin and we could pull the rods in those pre-cut increments. Yep. And, and then in, in a lot of cases, you know, either even though we did all that work, there was still still things in the field that didn't work out just right. So we had to make cuts anyway. And one of the great things that uh, Jim and, and the team did after that was was what you see on the right. And that is, wait a minute, we're still cutting this. And now there's, I mean, I don't know how often these are cut with porta bands or rod snippers or what, but now there's better tools in the field that can do this in a, in a really simple way. Why are we spending all this time in the BIM department trying to coordinate these hangers to the, you know, the spot on accuracy and then trying to cut them to that and then trying to get it to where the field guy has to go find the damn thing on the hanger rack on the left. Why can't they just cut it in the field to the right length? Yeah, so exactly. We put that back out in the field because they were they were recutting them a lot of the time anyway. So just for example, like the picture up on the screen, we did we obviously did analysis on 800 hangers that we did for a job. So we pulled it out of the estimate to get that first quantity. We said, OK, we're going to go off the estimate for these sizes and quantities. So it was 800 hangers when we did 800 hangers old method it took us 80 hours. When we did hangers, 800 hangers in this new method that you see on the right, we did those in 21 hours in the fab shop. So that is roughly 60 hours just in one entity where we saved. That's huge. It's massive. So Travis asked again, um, for these though, do you guys standardize on a rod size for each hanger size or is it based yeah, on- Yeah, we do. We have, a, we have a- a standard list that CAD uses it kind of follows the engineering spec as much as possible like I forget don't quote me on it it's either like four or five inch or six inch we go up to half inch rod and then we switch up to five okay. eighths and go to three quarters so yeah we've standardized on that as closely to a job spec as as we can yes sir right on so here here are some more metrics that we followed out the field um, on this particular job where those hangers you're seeing went to we used bangets on the job, six foot double clevises were used. So we tracked one package and this one package that they pulled out of the 800 hangers on site. Um, there was 140 hangers in that install package. The field hours were 40 hours of install time. Our fab hours were three hours of fab time for 147. And we did the, the, the percentage based off 800 hangers in 21 hours to come up with three hours. Delivery to the product to the job site was an hour. Um, grand total of actual hours were 44. So if I was to estimate those hangers, 140 hangers at an estimating factor of 0.5, and that would be a two inch clevis for us. So that's a little low. If, you, if we go back to the, you can see there's not too many two, there's more four threes on a little bigger than two on there. That would have been uh, 73 and a half hours of estimate estimate time. We did it all in 44 hours. So that's pushing 30 hours of savings just on the install side. So, and our feedback was from that foreman was he's, he's been on a lot of those CAD BIM commercial jobs. It was the fastest install hanger he's ever done yet. And there was no bad feedback. No, that's huge. And and, you know, actually, Chris Canner asked an interesting question. Actually, I'll, go, I'll let you go through this first. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So on the plumbing stub outs, those in-wall examples where we feel like we own that space, there's typically nobody in there. So why not develop a product, right? So we sent 36 to this job site. That was our PSO sixes. One person was able to install those. The field hours to install was one of them was an hour and 15 minutes per that was including their PEX and cast iron connections. Our fab hours to build one was 45 minutes. We've gotten faster since then, actually, on that. Kind of funny. A delivery of product to the job site was one hour again. Grand total of actual hours was three hours. Fab delivered and installed. The traditional estimate of that would have been seven hours. And overall, by 36, we would have saved, 100, we saved 144 hours on 
just so our lavatory stub just us on the estimate. Yeah. yeah, just on just off the estimate. Yeah. That's, that's so pretty good. And, okay. And here's and here's the real feedback, guys. It, it we do. You will have to work with your stud guys if they have a stud laying on center of the uh, excuse me the sink. Obviously, it has to move. So you got to work with your stud guys. They, and we've sent product to the job site like one way early on so the stud guys could see it. We'll do that. If that helps them understand what we're doing, we'll, we'll build one. We'll send it to that job ahead early on and, and let them have it on that job site. Or we'll ask them to come to our shop. We built a wall example, like 10 foot long stud wall where we have six different uh, plumbing products in there for to see. So, so Chris asked an interesting question here. Um, and it pertains to sort of both of those. Uh, he was saying that you know they've um, they've had similar issues with sort of the needle in the haystack with hangers, but also with small bore uh, copper and cast iron sizes when kitting. What is your approach for kitting an area? Uh, is the size of the area involved in a kit? Uh, and that's sort of the first question. I'll I'll stop with there. Excuse me. Okay, so for kitting out, we do it. We we try not to make the packages too big. Um, we used to do them huge and it was a needle in a haystack where we had, mm -hmm. it might've been a cast iron cut package, a gravity package, we call it. We used to do them where it was the whole floor. So it was 1300 cuts, very mm -hmm. confusing, too much. Um, it was confusing for the field. You had to label those. So we tag number every one of them. They don't get a spool sticker because it's a cut. So we write the tag number on there and we give that to our field in that manner. Um, and we get it, we give it with a kitted outfitting. So we, we made that much smaller. We don't want more than really around a hundred cut pieces in a package. And then yeah. we bury it up with the cut fittings or the, I'm sorry, the kitted outfittings that they need to install that package goes on the bottom side of the cart. Then all our cut pieces go on the top side of the, these little carts that we use. No, that's, that's, and that's exactly what I hear across the industry is that, you know, somewhere between 50 and a hundred cuts in a package. Um, and that can equate to the same number of spools, right? Because a lot of spools aren't more than a, maybe two or three cuts. Yeah, and if it's half iron, big size on that four inch, we're probably not going to go over 25 cut pieces just because it's so big and heavy. We don't want that cart to tip over. We want it to be safe. And we don't want a package that doesn't fit on one cart. If it fits on two, you know, the field is going to probably get a little confused with that. They're, they could take one over here and one goes over there. We want it all to fit on one cart. That's, that makes a lot of sense. So, okay. So the second part of the question was as part of these, the proof book and, and the catalog that you're building has, um, has the estimating team started using the labor hours you're, you're starting to see uh, as, as part of their estimating process or is yes. it still? Yes, sir. That's the cool. whole point of this, right? So we took that feedback that you've seen on that I just showed you from our job we gave it back to estimating and we recently estimated like an apartment complex where we took that analysis and we looked at similar apartment complexes stacked mm -hmm. out. We're going to use those products and we, we use those numbers. Absolutely. We're anything we can circle back to estimating as I'm sure you, all you guys out there know, it's hard to really understand the true benefits of fabrication. Sometimes know, know those metrics to get back to estimating products help with that hundred yep. percent. And, and Jesse Gorman asked, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but uh, do you guys install um, in-wall packages prior to framing going up or, uh, or after? And, and if it's after, what kind of coordination issues do you get? So we used to, like in another market, we used to build a metal bracket that we had to weld it up that our, our plumbers would go through before the walls even up. They would lay out the wall. They would mount that bracket that would have the two inch on it and it'd have their waters to it and they stove pipe that. That's how we used to do it in, in a market. Well, now we're shipping them products and they're loving it. it. It was a little bit of a behavior change because they like getting in there before the stud guys. So then we didn't have that stud laying out on the center of a lavvy or anything like that. So sure. it eliminated that. Um, so that's that was one benefit to doing that. But when we made that bracket, there was three hours on that bracket just alone to weld that up, cut the steel. They had standoffs on there back in the day. So again, that's why we chose the Suchi products. Snap, quick, expand, screw it in, super fast and easy. Nice. Uh, all right, and one last one uh, before, we got about 10 or so minutes uh, until 
but we need to wrap it up, but I want to let you continue through this. But Dave Basigi sure. uh, over at our friends at Pipe Server asked, how reproducible are these uh, these metrics in the sense of like, you know, you, you, you say it takes three hours. What sort of safety factor do you need to put on that from an estimating perspective to make sure it's not that you guys were just rocking it on that job? So what we did was like on the hangar products, for example, like we, we had that crew from that job that we did it first on, we had a foreman and his right-hand man. His right-hand man led the charge on the hangers. So we took him to the next job. He was our champion in a way on that next job to show him how they did that job, means and method wise. So identify those champions, get those guys on the next job so they can share with those teams. And you're building your people out with that knowledge. And that's what, that's what we did. That's what made it work on the next job and the next job and the next job is sprinkling that knowledge out to, to your journeyman. Awesome. So what's next? Okay. What's next for modern? Uh, where are we going? Continue to build more products, improving on them, analyzing the data, keep, keep building that. Um, I think I didn't answer Dave's question on factoring yeah. on products. Yeah. Um, from an estimating perspective, you know, we're, that was our first run at it. So we've actually cut our fabrication time down to 20 minutes instead of being 40 on the repeatable, you know, that was our first stab at it guys. So that was the first job we ever did it on. So it wasn't probably our best. So we know we're only going to get faster the more we do them. So that's kind of our safety factor. We were, we thought there when we estimated yeah, the least, the, the least efficient you're going to be the first time you try it. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, again, and and I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, or, or point out that obviously you're using M suite products throughout this whole process. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, it. so yeah. And the whole benefit of M suite, we put, we put our products in there, every drawing that we get, whether it's a hand ISO from our field on an industrial job, it's engineered drawings, it goes into fab pro and we use that to track our percent complete with, we use that data. It, we use it with our DNF schedule. So in FabPro, what we do is we put the due date on the package. We ask our foreman to go in and put the due date on every package on his project. So what that does is M-Suite will send an automatic email notification to the people that are signed up for it as they revise those due dates and set those. So we have our shipping guy, he gets those notifications. So what he does, he sees all the due dates change. He goes and puts it in the FabPro calendar we use our shipping, that's our shipping calendar for our whole company. Anybody can get on M Suite and see. So you can kind of see what's going on, where they're going, deliveries, even if you don't have fabrication happening, all deliveries go in there. Even if it's outside of Fab Pro, if it's a, a tools that are going to the job, they put it in, in the Fab Pro calendar. So tons of benefits to seeing it. And, and I think, you know, the big thing is, is you guys are working on pulling all the data to the SharePoint site that we can pull into Power BI or something else. So we're working on that. That's going to be great. We're going to be able to pull all those uh, well diameter inches per person by material type, by job, however we want. It's going to be, we're excited for that to get rolling. So we're working on that too. Um, cool. But future, um, carrier templates, we've, we've worked on those. So we made carrier templates for ourselves, skid frames, it's racks and multi-trade racks. And at, well, the new one that came up was urinals. We're gonna standardize on different urinal types and put those forms in on our SharePoint site. So here's kind of the carrier examples. We, we'll put them together. The, the longest we've, we've had to go was I think eight carriers. So that's as far as we went. So we drew them, excuse me, using Zern. And then we drew the same thing using Watts. That's typically who we use on carriers. We do have some Sioux Chief carriers in our hands. They're coming out with their own carrier. They're they're pretty sweet, pretty excited that. So we will develop ones for the Sioux Chief carriers. Um, so it's a template. We don't hold ourselves to it. Our field guides, it, it might be hard to see, but in that little block on the bottom right, they can fill out a couple dimensions based off looking at the architectural prints like you would if you were doing it in the field. Put the dimensions on there, the center to center, the height of the water, what they want the waters left or right. So this might show the waters on the left, but there's a box to, to check waters left or right, how they want them. And they just put three or four dimensions in there. We're fabricating them. They can pull it. CAD doesn't have to draw it over and over again. Um, we just did some for a job that wasn't BIM design coordinated project where uh, that foreman, 
he used the template and we fabbed four different carrier batteries for him on a on a school remodel job. So it's working, okay. it's working good. And this just kind of shows um, how our CAD took it into a Revit library. They made this as a part in there. It's kind of showing that. That's it. Awesome. Uh, we have one last poll before we uh, finish up with some questions. I'm going to launch that now. And uh, if you guys wouldn't mind answering this last question, it's just what are the most important factors when fabricating? Uh, which of the below have the largest impact on your decision to prefab? And for me, you know, in the conversations I have across in really North America at this point, it, it varies widely. Uh, sometimes it's well, it's all about the productivity. We save so many hours, kind of like you're talking about here, uh, here at Modern. Uh, but other times it's, well, it's just, it's reduced congestion on the job site. There's far less risk that something's going to happen on site and uh, I'm going to get in a position where I'm stuck and I can't do anything. So um, it varies all over the country. And, and some of the things that are, that not everybody picks up on is like, you know, green jobs are kind of, that was a big thing a couple of years ago any cardboard that you got to think about, like if, if we weren't sending it to the fab shop where we have helpers kit everything out, that's that low dollar an hour person kitting things out. So we have a couple helpers in our fab shop on the piping side. That's all they do. Clean the shop, yeah. get everything out, check it in, make sure it's accurate. They're getting rid of all the cardboard waste. You think about it, if you do that on a job site, that's probably going to be a journey or an yeah. apprentice, you know, where those dollar an hours are expensive. You want them guys efficient, installing as much as they can in that day i don't i wouldn't want them taking cardboard out for a couple hours we do that in the shop and we take care of the waste here there's no recycle bin on the job site they're just getting the product that they need on the carts that make them fast and efficient Absolutely. and then it's in the energy savings too we're using our power here versus trying to set up power on a job site using their that goes on their electrical bill so there's you know or there's diesel generators that you all can't over overlook the yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So mitigate risk, improve schedule, reduce cost. Those are the top three, obviously. Um, I find it interesting that improved safety was so low, but it, it is a huge, uh, con you know, contributing factor to improve safety. So very, uh, very appreciative to all of you that answered the questions. And um, yeah, if there's any other questions from the crowd, Todd, that you were watching, feel free to ask, but uh, otherwise I think we're wrapping up. Todd, you're muted. About that, we did have uh, a couple that had come in, but one that was interesting was uh, what happens if you don't have a model? I know you talk a lot about Jim when you have the model, you can work off the models are highly accurate. What do you do when 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 we don't have a model to work off? Of? So we can we what we do is we'll take the engineered drawings that we might get because we're heavy industrial in this area. There's a lot of industrial plants right around us that we're bedded in and. They want modern to do the work there. We have guys on site all the time. So, you know, you get the engineered drawings that you're bidding off of. We fabricate off those. So our foreman will mark up field welds on those, number the spools, weld map them if we have to. And that's how we fabricate off. So then when we do that, that's our shop guys having to come up with that cut list, generate it manually to send to 3D PP or a pipe server. Um, so that's why we like the technology and, and we've actually done some jobs where we get a Navis works model from the customer. We trace it and convert it into a Revit model. So then we can use our CAD department to auto spool with BIM Pro, use those efficiencies. We can send then the cut list to the cut table where we don't have that shop guy. Like we did that on a, on a big job, a $7 million industrial job. We traced the model. We auto spooled it then we convert it into, into revit then we use the BIMPRO auto spooling and we can use the technology so we figured on that job roughly we're going to have a fab shop manager making a cut list if we went off the engineered drawings for two months we eliminated that and used those resources in cad they can automate it um, and send it to our pipe cutter that's automated so then all those cuts are automated they're not manual anymore have the holes on them Bevels all the are building, right. All Everything's the right. It saves yeah. a ton of time. Sorry, I know we're running out of time. We have one last question from the from the, the folks in the audience, and I want to really address this because it's a great question. You talk going back to the standardizing of hanger rods. 
how do you factor in the time it takes for the people in the field to then measure and cut? And what, are, what information are you providing them to make sure that they have the correct dimension to cut? So that was a struggle. I'll, I'll be honest at first, we weren't sending, when we did that, it was the information wasn't the best accurate going out to the field. We had to work hard to get the right information on the drawing then because it was a change. Um, we've standardized on how we install bangets. So we install all our bangets at the same plane now. Um, that gives CAD one dimension for their department, then it's on an install print. They get the cut list that the fab shop used to get end to end length. They, we just give it out to the field. And it used to be a couple of different measurements CAD had to pull depending on how we installed the bangets in the metal decking, the corrugated mm -hmm. deck. So we've standardized on that. So all our bangets are at the same plane, made CAD information movement easier. So then it got the accurate information out to the field. So then our field guys, we made a rod cutting station um, that we can put the install print on. There's two rod cutters flush mounted into an orbital gang box, if you will, that has drawers on it. We fill it with the nuts and washers, three eighths, half inch, five eighths, three quarter. And then they're cutting their rods right on that rod cutting station that's set up the three eighths and half. Five so eighths and three quarter have to do You're by still kind of pre prefabricating it. You're just prefabricating it in the area that it needs to be installed. Yeah, and, and why cut it twice, you know? Um, mm -hmm. We were presenting on this at Advancing Prefab and there was somebody that mentioned, they just cut their hanger six inches end to end rod and put it on every trapeze or clevis. Then they send it out to the field and the field is cutting it. And it was like, it was a little bit of a challenge conversation. It's like, well, why would you do that if you don't have to? Why would you cut it? Mm -hmm. And if you can eliminate any step along the way, you know you're gonna save labor. It's, you know, common sense there. And they're actually putting a rod coupling on it, another step for the field to do. So that's, we just looked at it, you know, and talked about it as a group. It was actually one of our owner's idea to put the double clevis on there. It wasn't even mine, you know, it, it sometimes it takes a village. It takes a lot of input, right? Absolutely. And you gotta take that input, but. Awesome. Thank you, Jim, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Todd, back to you, man. Awesome. Well, if there are no more questions coming in from the field, um, we would just like to wrap up um, this, this webinar on best practices for prefabrication. really want to thank Jim, both you and Britton, um, for your time today. I know I learned a ton. If, if the participants today got half of what I did, I'm sure they're going to walk away with a lot more knowledge on prefabrication. What are some of the things we can do to improve the way we do it today? I know there's no perfect way because every company has their own nuances, but I think there's a lot of learnings that people could have and hopefully did come, uh, come out with today. So really appreciate the times. Um, if anybody's looking for more information on uh, prefabrication solutions um, or you have any additional questions that we weren't able to address during this call, um, please either visit the DeWalt website or feel free to reach out to Jim and Britton. Uh, their contact info is here on the slide. <clears throat> I will also be sending out this information um, and an email following the webinar, along with any of the responses to questions that may come in last second that we're only able to get to. Um, if you found this informative, please feel free to share with your colleagues. Uh, again, this webinar was recorded, so it will be posted with a link where you can go back and rewatch it or forward it to any colleagues you think may be able to benefit from it. Um, on behalf of DeWalt, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, we'd love to see you next time for our, our next webinar next uh, in October which will be prefabrication model the machine. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks everybody. Yep, thank you.